If you are looking for an easy and simple automated furnace setup, then you are definitely at the wrong place. Because today we are engineering the perfect furnace setup. Something that's extremely fast, accurate and fuel efficient. So in order to get perfect control, we need to be able to control both the pressure up and down as well as the temperature up and down. And the pressure is easy, the temperature is a bit tricky, especially to increase. There are solutions to use some kind of electric heating, but I'm going to go for the combustion type. But the problem with that is that you need at least 5% of fuel inside the furnace before it lets you combust the fuel. You can see it won't let me combust this even though there are fuel in there. So we need to work around that problem somehow. Perhaps we do something like this. We just mix our fuel straight into a small pipe segment. That way we can ignite it inside here and ensure that we ignite the fuel in small quantities. Okay, but how can we ensure that we get ignition in the pipe? Well, if we heat up, let's say, the oxygen enough so that the combined temperature when the gas is mixed is more than the self-ignition point, we know that we can get the ignition we need in this small pipe. And how can we heat up the oxygen? Well, if we set a box up around the furnace, the air inside there will get really hot we can just cycle some of it through and heat up the oxygen that way. So we got some logic to handle the oxygen and it's uh, filling up and it's heating itself on the furnace. But how do we know exactly what temperature we need for self-ignition? My thermal dynamics is a bit lackluster, but thankfully for us our Reddit user has already done the grunt work for us. I'm sorry I'm not gonna try to pronounce your name, but a big thanks to you for enabling us to do this. This post goes into detail about everything we're going to do now, except this is for a gas mixer, and that's just not gonna cut it. We need it for a volume pump. So we can just translate all this math here, over to using volume pumps instead, and that looks something like this. So here we have our formula for the volume pump into the igniter pipe, and down here we have a formula for the temperature we need on the oxygen. All right, so while heating up the oxygen here, we had, I had to, uh, chug some ice in there to heat up the furnace a bit more and we had a little bit of contamination but ah it's not a problem and according to our calculation we are now 172 degrees above what we need to to have ignition so the next part is to automate the ignition system a second i see to the collection here and we now have automated ignition as you can see, we have some hot gas in the pipe and we can see it in action if I manually start to fill my buffer tank here. Uh, that's low. We can see the system in action. Now that we have solved the problem of heat, it's the next problem, and that's the problem of cooling. Well, we have the waste gases coming out of the furnace. We, we can store that and reuse that, of course, but if we need to cool even more, well, we can still use the same gas. We can just pump some of it over here and run it through some radiators and this will cool down nicely. 
of course, if we had been on Mars or Europa, we could just capture some atmosphere, but ah, this is good enough. One more IC, just to automate the uh, volume pump uh, here and the volume pump there, and uh, we are ready to connect everything up to the furnace. And um, yeah, now it's just a problem of how to control these three volume pumps. The obvious solution would probably be to create two different PID controllers, one for temperature and one for pressure and then a temperature set point and then a pressure set point. But there are some inherent problems with this. First of all, temperature and pressure are two values that's highly connected. It's hard to change one without changing the other. So having two different PID controllers will probably end up just fighting each other. And the other problem is that the range of the pressure and temperature, I guess, for the furnace are so great that you have to choose between either speed or instability. Instead, we can just use the same math as we used earlier and expand it to the furnace and make a perfect mathematical model of how the furnace behaves, both temperature and pressure. So we set it up exactly the same as we did earlier and the first we end up with is this formula for the temperature, the next game tick, given all these variables. And equally, this is the, the formula for the pressure, the next game tick. Now there is no way we are going to fit this into the MIPS code. So we need to do some simplification. Firstly, we assume that all the heat capacities are the same. It's uh, good enough anyway. And secondly, we just assume that the pressure in the three feeding pipes we have are all the same. That's easy enough to handle anyway. So with that, we end up with these two formulas. And these are much more manageable. And you can see a couple of interesting things here. Firstly, the temperature is not determined by what the pressure is, the next game tick. And the pressure is not determined by the temperature at all. And secondly, the three volume pump inputs we have are all handled equally. So we can just introduce a new variable that the that describes all three together, the volume pump sum, and that makes it even easier. But how do we implement this in MIPS? I mean, the question is what the volume pump settings should be, not what the pressure should be. We know what the pressure should be. To get that answer, we need to flip the formulas and do a couple more assumptions. Firstly, we want to know what the heat volume pump should be. Assuming the cooling volume pump and the waste volume pump is off. And that's simple enough. And doing the same thing for the cooling volume pump, it's pretty much the same formula. And the next question is how much input do we need overall? And that's actually the smallest formula so far. Given these three values, we can now calculate what the last volume pumps should be. And these are systems, uh, but they are pretty much the same formula four times, so it's easy enough to implement in MIPS. And lastly, we need to know what the output on the furnace should be. And that's pretty much it. Now we just need to implement it in MIPS. One more IC into the system, and I got to be honest, this one was a bit of a squeeze. Even without any aliases, we had to use every single available line. So, yeah. And I had to get a bit creative when gathering all the information we need for the formulas, because it only has six screws. So, actually, this I see down here is pasting 
the temperature for the coolant pipe and the yellow pipe over there onto the settings variable. So a little bit creative solution to get more data into the controller, but ah, it works. So yeah, I mean it's running, it's at set point. Let's try to change uh, set point and uh, see what happens. Let's uh, try to go up to 15 megapascal, maybe. I mean, it's not terribly fast yet, but um, pretty damn accurate. Then we just need some displays to see what's happening inside the furnace. And perhaps an ingot library to make it easy to switch between the different ingots and automatically changes the temperature. We'll try it out. Yeah, seems to work. And just for the heck of it, let's uh, install a ice calculator to see our ice consumption. Okay, let's be honest. I know this is completely over-engineered beyond all practical purposes, but don't tell me this isn't sexy. We are increasing the pressure by 2 megapascals to 20 and the temperature isn't even flinching. And we're there. Lastly, we'll do a little test here. I have prepared two silos, one with iron and one with nickel. And we'll smelt up some, some inver. And um, why inver? Because inver has a really small window of uh, temperature and pressure. So we really get to see our furnace in action. So let's kick it into gear. So about 10,000 inver later, our pressure and temperature barely changed at all while smelting this up, as you can see in the time lapse. And our ice total came to 19 units of volatile ice and 10 of oxides. So that's it. Thank you guys for watching. I got no idea why anyone would want to install this in a survival playthrough, but if you want to have a look at it, I'll of course leave it on the workshop.